we will um, present together this PowerPoint because this is the result of a collaboration we had uh, these last years. So we are going to speak about Andra uh, Cesalpino's botany and more specifically about the work we did on the Deplantis Libris, uh, which is, as I said, a collaboration between Corentin Tresny and I about the translation and edition of the first book of uh, this series of 16 books Cesalpino published in 1583. So there were no translation at all or no edition at all in any other languages than the original Latin uh, edition that was available. So we thought it was very important to publish and translate this uh, uh, book, very important regarding the history of botany. And also because in the topic of the, the research center uh, today, it develops a new relationship with medicine uh, that was in rupture with uh, what was made before. And as philosophers, it was also important for us to work on the Aristotelian aspect and con context of uh, uh, Alpino's science and especially uh, his botany. Uh, Corentin, please, next slide. So um, very briefly, who was uh, Cesar Alpino? He was a student of Luca Guini at Pisa, a famous professor of botany of uh, the time, the uh, supposed inventor of the herbiary, the dried uh, uh, plant herb herb herbarium. Uh, Cesar Alpino became professor of botany and of medicine in Pisa, and he was also director of the Pisa Botanic Garden one of the, the oldest uh, in the world. He moved to Rome after that as professor of medicine at La Sapienza and also as the archaeatrist of Pope Clement VIII. So he was his personal uh, doctor at the papal court. Uh, his re research uh, and publication revolved around botany, of course. Uh, this is the topic of the day, but also medicine. Pharmacology, Aristotelian philosophy, chemistry, physics, astronomy, and theology. Uh, next slide, please. So the historical context of the Plantis uh, is important to better understand the scope and the stakes of this uh, book. This is a landmark for plant morphology uh, in the history of botany. And above all, this is very a very important book for plant uh, classification. Uh, indeed, Alpino dismissed uh, layman load knowledge and uh, more generally the uses of plants for classifying plants uh, and more generally to uh, understand botany. He developed a kind of field practice uh, in collecting uh, plants uh, on the field, for example, and also in the uh, botanic garden, as I said. And it, just, it justified uh, this positioning of botany, saying, for example, that the variety and beauty of plants was a sufficient reason to study them. Uh, this is something he, states, uh, he stated explicitly in the preface uh, of uh, his book. And some, some, something is said also in other parts of uh, the De Plantis we are going to, to speak ab about. But at the same time, as a Renaissance thinker, uh, he was uh, influenced by Theophrastus and Aristotle. Uh, even if he was quite critical also with uh, these ancient authorities, especially uh, uh, towards uh, Dioscorides or Pliny, for example. Uh, the historical relationship he had with other Renaissance thinkers, uh, especially Italian Renaissance thinkers, is more cryptic because he doesn't uh, cite a lot of them. But we could um, we construct some of his influences uh, or relationship with 
some other text of the Renaissance. And also to another famous botanist of the time in France, Jean Ruel, who is the only non-Italian botanist he quote in De Plantis. And what is very interesting in De Plantis is that it showed an emancipation of botany from medicine, because as you know, at the time, all the botanists were also uh, doctors in medicine. But uh, Cesar Pino uh, broke with this tradition uh, explicitly in De Plantis as a methodological stance. So for example, I quote, he said, uh, for example, in the, the, one of the dedication letter he wrote, I quote, but Dioscar reads, as a physician only accepted the, the classification according to medical properties on the, on the account of which the saps, the tears, the roots, the seeds, and the other parts of plants are ordinarily looked for. And also in the same letter, he said, I quote, I have considered it superfluous to add the medical property. In fact, these have been expounded by many authors and above all at great length by Joseph Reed and Galen. So he thought that his own work in botany should be different than the traditional work regarding medicinal properties, pharmacological aspects of plants, uh, or the ancillary aspects of botany um, uh, towards medicine. He wanted to create an autonomous botany theoretical botany, but also useful in a, um, um, in a way for medicine, but not dependent uh, on medicine. And this is also something you can see in the plantis itself, for example, in chapter 14, where he says, finally, the differences that we are looking at here and which are a result of specific nature, like the medicinal properties of plants, their taste and other attributes, attributes in which physicians are primarily interested are, however, not constituent to the substance, even if they are somehow present per se. So he did not dismiss totally uh, these properties, but he said that it was not important or not essential to uh, build a, a theoretical classification of that. Uh, next slide, please. So this new way of thinking uh, about botany was uh, really important and influential to later botanists especially between the 17th and uh, the end of the 19th century. So a lot of them quote or refer to the Plantis. Uh, we can cite among them John Ray, Joseph Tournefort, Linnaeus, of course, but also Antoine Laurent de Jussieu or uh, Augustin Pyramus de Candol, who are all very important um, all very important uh, botanists, re especially regarding the improvement of classification. Uh, but the, at the same time, uh, the influence of Cesalpino on botany uh, disappeared or was um, mitigated during the 20th century for several reasons. Uh, one of them is probably because the text in itself is really hard to read and because it was not translated from Latin to any other uh, modern languages, it became really um, difficult to access it, especially for modern scientists uh, uh, of all time, but also because it is at the same time a philosophical Aristotelian, uh, Aristotelian essay. So the botanical improvement of part was sometimes um, obscured by uh, this uh, speculative or philosophical consideration. Um, so we, we can discuss it more uh, later. Uh, so I'm going to uh, deal uh, a little uh, in more detail with uh, the, the actual contents of the first book of the Plantis Libri. But before that, um, just a few words on uh, what we have uh, actually done 
uh, with this text. So our task during these few years, uh, as uh, Kantin previously said, was to propose a modern edition and an English translation of Cesalpino's first book, uh, De Plantis on Plants. So the, this book, the, this first book is quite short, 30 uh, pages, 30 uh, 16th century Latin pages, but still that's not a lot, uh, which are written in a quite dense uh, style. Uh, there was only one edition printed, as said, in 1583. So all critical apparatus only serve to mark two kinds of interventions. In the, printed, in the printed text. On the one hand, we applied the correction proposed by Cesalpino himself in the Eratum of the 1583 edition, and on the other, we corrected a few obvious typos. The rest of the text, the Latin text, we left untouched, otherwise, otherwise untouched, except for uh, some of the 16th century abbreviation, which we have modernized. So the quid, uh, the ad, and so, and so on, uh, which we uh, transcripted in a more, um, modern fashion. Uh, in particular, we have retained the general organization of the text that we you can see here, for example, the, the beginning of the fourth chapter. Um, in 14 long continuous chapter with long and quite complex sentences. It is only in the English text that we have proposed uh, finer grain finer grain subdivisions of the text in, uh, I think, 157 uh, paragraphs, uh, as you can see here, one for each idea or argument put forth by Cesalpino, at least according to our reading. Uh, within the paragraph, we have chosen to cut the text in sentences uh, much, much shorter than the original. So both our divisions in paragraphs and in sentences inevitably depends on our reading and interpretation of the text. So uh, obviously they must be taken with care. Nonetheless, we felt it was necessary to do so in one way or, the, or, or, or another in order to uh, obtain an intelligible text, especially for the uh, English version of the text. So uh, I think that uh, the Latin text is also much more readable with our division uh, in mind that we have um, marked here between uh, brackets uh, for the for the sake of clarity and uh, ease of reading. Uh, now concerning the, the actual content of the first book, uh, the, the book one that we have worked on uh, is divided into uh, 14 chapter offering um, a general discussion on of the nature of plants, their vital functions and their parts. Each chapter has a specific topic and all follow in a logical order. Uh, the first book can be uh, divided quite clearly in uh, two parts, so we say at least. Uh, chapters 1 to 11 focus on morphology, anatomy and physiology. They describe the essential operations of plants uh, while chapter 12 to 14 introduce the classification into genera and species and the methodological principle that are going to be followed in the other 15 books. Um, so in more details, uh, chapter one, as you can see, uh, discusses some general questions about plants and in particular, the question of the soil of plants uh, its location, so the location of this soil, the main parts of the plant in general, and the faculties with which each uh, part is associated, according to Cesalpino. Chapter 2 describes the functioning of the nutri nutritive faculty for obtaining and processing food. Uh, chapter 3 uh, deals with growth, uh, which is the other aspect of the nutritive faculty, uh, and it also deals with the role of the bark, the pith, and leaf, which are connected uh, with this, uh, this faculty, this first faculty of the plants. Chapter 4 focuses on the early stages of plant growth, that is, development from either seed or sobol. This provides a transition to the analysis uh, of the other main faculty of the plants, so the second uh, natural faculties of the plants, according to Cesalpino, namely reproduction. And this is the focus of chapter five. Um, so the vegetative reproduction. 
Then the chapter six concentrates on seeds, their morphology, the germination, and uh, the mode of their division. Chapter seven is devoted to flowers, so also to reproduction, uh, to the, compos the compositions, the composition of flowers, their morphology, and the role uh, that they that they take in the protection and reproduction of the plants. Chapter eight describes fruit, the pericarp and the bark that protect the seed. Then the genesis, usefulness, and the composition of the pericarp are discussed in chapter nine, and other forms of protection in chapter 10, which also contains a section on fruiting. And finally, chapter 11 deals very briefly, that's a very short chapter, with secondary parts such as tendril, thorns, or moss. Then with chapter 12, we have a kind of new beginning in the first book, at least the beginning of a new part. Uh, chapter 12, chapter, chapter 12 sorry, opens the second part of the book by reviewing the four traditional genera of Theophrastus and discussing the criteria according to which subgenera are usually defined, uh, mostly to uh, refute them. Chapter 13 then argues for a definition of genera and subgenera based solely on the essential parts of the plants, so the roots and the stem, and on the, ma the main operations, so nutrition, growth on the one hand and reproduction on the other, uh, that the vegetative soil enable plants to perform via these parts. And uh, lastly, chapter 14 extends this argument by examining specific problems arising when subgenera are defined according to the reproductive operation. So this chapter led a theoretical background underlying the structure of plant description in the following 15 books. Uh, it is worth noting that no practical or medical consideration are uh, include, included in this first book, except in order to uh, refuse them, which is, as Quentin said, a small revolution for the time. Uh, book, two, book 2 to 16, which we did not translate, uh, contain a description of uh, a lot, uh, I think 1,500 uh, different species about. Uh, so these species are presented um, not according to their properties or their uh, medical or, or culinary considerations, uh, but uh, following the four major Theophrastian genera. So book two and three are devoted to, to trees and shrubs, while book four to 16 to under shrubs and herbs. So that's for the general structure of the first book. Now, what is the method that uh, justifies this uh, this uh, structure? Uh, Chisapina method of investigation has been um, rigorously appreciated by its reader uh, during the course of history. For some readers, are, for example, Charles Schmidt, uh, Chisapina was an innovator, an original scientist that built a modern rational botany against the pitfalls of Galenic and Aristotelian tradition. For other th uh, readers, on the other hand, as Shiro, for example, Cesarpino was a brilliant mind that was, however, way too slavishly attached to Aristotle's doctrine. Well, as often, the truth uh, lies somewhere in between. Uh, because if one reads Cesarpino's major philosophical works, the question is uh, peripateticae, it becomes clear that the Italian philosopher knew Aristotle very well, that he was deeply committed to defend a rigorous reading of Aristotle consistent to, with what he took to be the true Christian doctrine. He did so using only passages from various works of Aristotle himself, mainly the De Anima, the Physics, the Metaphysics, and the Posterior Analytics. In particular, he attempted to reconstruct a coherent Aristotelian methodology, for scientific investigation, which should begin, according to Cesalpino, with um, uh, empiric induction, then proceed to the method of division, and then to complete demonstrative definitions, which allow clear intellection of substances and so species. Uh, such a general project shed some light to the seemingly chaotic um, structure of uh, book one. So this. Uh, this uh, uh, list of chapters. Um, 
Indeed, the first 11 chapters are, are a thorough uh, general characterization of plants on the basis of the recursive observation. So that's for the induction part. And then chapter uh, 12 to 14 use all this discussion to propose a division of all plants in four great genera and a, met and a method to define each species in relation to universal criteria. So it seems that in this first book, Cesar Pino followed very closely what he took to be the classical Aristotelian method of science, at least as he reconstructed this uh, method. Uh, book one even begins with a discussion of very classical scholastic problems, the difference between psychic faculties in animals and in plants, and the question of the location of souls in plants. Now, as those of you who are well versed in the history of Aristotelianism know very well, uh, those questions are uh, clearly settled, well, neither in Aristotle writing nor in the subsequent tradition. The articulation between the treatment of science and various uh, in the various treaties of Aristotle is still unclear today. So the model reconstructed by Cesalpino, although it claims to be a mere commentary on Aristotle, is itself a very personal and innovative take on traditional texts. In many respects, uh, Cesalpino drew conclusions that are granted on Aristotle's authority, but that go much further than anything that can be found in Aristotle's texts. Moreover, the careful observation that warrant uh, Cesalpino's division and definition are much more precise than those of his Aristotelian predecessors. This allowed Cesalpino to use the Aristotelian theoretical, theoretical sorry, framework to draw conclusions that are sometimes foreign to anything that can be found in Aristotle, but also in Theophrastus or in the pseudo-Aristotelian treatises. For example, Cesalpino admitted the possibility of a very basic perception in plants which is contrary to the logic of uh, Aristotle doctrines of psychic faculties as they can be found in, uh, in the anima. In a word, uh, Cesalpino was neither slavishly following Aristotelian tradition nor willing to break, uh, to break sorry, with it in any way, at least not explicitly. On the contrary, he was very careful to use what he took to be uh, Aristotle's methods, even to the point of reaching conclusion different from what was commonly admitted in uh, the Aristotelian tradition. Now, one of the main principles then that uh, Cesalpino inherited from Aristotle is that every substance must be defined on the basis of its uh, essential function and on nothing else. These essential functions, as uh, I have already hinted to, are the, are the natural aims of the object in question. In the case of plants, their natural aims are first to feed and grow, and second to reproduce. The first function, so feed and grow, uh, defines the four higher genera, so the trees, the shrubs, the undershrubs, and the herbs, that uh, Cisalpino uh, takes from uh, Theophrastus. And the second uh, function, so uh, to reproduce, allows to distinguish subgenera or species within the four higher genera. No other criterion is allowed by Cesalpino to uh, define uh, subgenera or species of plants. So, um, yes, so that's what, uh, yes. Um, so yes, uh, in a very Aristotelian way, what might say uh, more Aristotelian than Aristotle himself sometimes, the final causes are the criteria of scientific classification. So these are uh, aims. So uh, aims of what? That would be a question. Uh, in the, uh, well, whose aims are these final cause? In the uh, Questiones Peripateticae, Cesalpino attempted to demonstrate that the Aristotelian God is the ultimate final cause, uh, and that this uh, ultimate final cause is compatible with the Christian God. But on the other hand, in uh, the De Plantis Liberi, a God is never uh, mentioned, at least never explicitly. Um, this does not preclu preclude Cesalpino to make abundant use of a finalist, a very finalist uh, vocabulary, Plants are supposed to be endowed uh, with such and such parts, 
which are dedicated to such and such function. Plants are given such and such behavior in order to fulfill such and such needs, and so on. Uh, there's a lot of use of uh, the dative of advantage, uh, for example, also. It seems that all these aims are the aims of uh, nature it's, itself. That is uh, the nature or the substance of each plant. So uh, we do not talk about God, but we talk a lot about nature in this first book. And nature, the nature of each uh, species of plant, seems to have its own aims. And uh, this finalism is a principle of explanation of, in Cesalpino's framework. The substance of uh, a given reality, for example here a plant, is entirely, is entirely reductible to its final causes, that is, to its uh, natural aims. And individual plants may then be said more or less perfect, uh, depending on how far it is able to uh, fulfill its natural aims, that is, uh, to what extent it is able to, to feed, to grow, and to reproduce. Uh, so that, and, and this uh, finalism uh, grants the whole method of uh, classifications uh, of plants in Cesalpino. Now, um, a few words also on something very uh, prevalent in the first book of uh, the Plantis, namely uh, analogies. Uh, although Cesalpino conceived finality as a real orientation of nature and not uh, as, a, as an image or as a heuristic uh, device, he uh, still often used analogy to describe and to explain plant functioning. The most common analogy is the analogy with animals, which is a very classical analogy. Uh, plant parts and processes are mapped onto similar features observed in animals. Uh, this practice follows uh, established Aristotelian methodology. Less familiar, less familiar concepts are explained through reference to more familiar ones. Uh, so we do not know a lot about plants, but we know much more about animals than we use what we know about animals in order to better understand plants. Okay. Uh, and thus, plants are, at least in the very first chapters of uh, the first book, considered through the lens of uh, zoological concepts. Uh, this does not preclude Cesalpino to specify very early, actually in the first chapter, the limits of the analogy. Though plants are comparable to animals insofar as they are able to feed, grow, and reproduce, they still lack sensation, desire, and locomotion, which are characteristic of animals. So that's the anima here. That being said, analogy is a very recurrent tool of explanation and philosophical argumentation in book one. More precisely, Cesalpino compares plants to animals in three different ways, at least. First, a part in plants may be described and thus better understood by comparing it, comparing it to a part in animals that fulfill the same function or that is supposed or claimed to fulfill the same function. For example, roots carry food in plants in the same way as veins do in animals. So, or, or so uh, Cisalpino thinks. Therefore, some properties of veins which we know well about, can provide an, explan an explan explanatory sorry, model for plants, which we know little about. We can better understand roots with the help of what we know about uh, veins. Now, second use, after this descriptive use, second use, um, when a given function is, is fulfilled in animal through a certain organ, some analogon of this organ is thought by, by Cesalpino to exist in plant, even if it can't be observed. For example, the heart in animals oversees the dispatching of food throughout the animal body, uh, according to, to Cesalpino once again. And this dispatching is also observed in plants. So uh, there is some kind of dispatching of energy uh, or of food in plants. Therefore, one must suppose that there exists something analogous to a heart in plants. Uh, okay. 
So uh, even if this heart cannot be uh, observed, one cannot observe a heart in plants, but since the function uh, of dispatching food is observed and that this function is fulfilled by a heart in animals, therefore there must be a heart, a kind of heart, an analogon to, to, uh, to the heart in plants. But lastly, there's also um, problematic or problem-making uh, use of the analogy. The analogy may lead to difficulties when uh, it is seen in the light of Aristotelian biology. For example, it can be observed that animals differentiate uh, suitable food from non-suitable food through, uh, thanks uh, to their sensation. Uh, but plants themselves are able to uh, nourish themselves suitably. Therefore, plants ought to have some analogon to sensation if we follow the same logic than in the previous use of the analogy. Now, the problem is that uh, if we keep the Aristotelian framework uh, within this framework, uh, the, the lack of, of a sensitive soul in plants is supposed to prevent them to have any kind of sensation. So this analogon of sensation cannot possibly resemble animal sensation. This leads Cesalpino to consider different um, explain models of explanation for uh, in order to explain this uh, selective feeding in plants. Uh, he considers uh, to compare plants with uh, magnets, uh, with a goat skin, uh, and lastly with an oil lamp, an oil lamp with an N. Uh, the latter will actually be retained uh, in Cesalpino's explanation. Uh, just like, just as oil lamps, uh, plants are able to select their food through a kind of capillary filtration. Uh, so the combination of the classical Aristotelian uh, animal analogy with the uh, Aristotelian doctrine, actual doctrine that as they can be found in the anima, uh, lead, this combination leads to a new a quasi-mechanistic perspective on plants. And this provides, I think, a, a nice illustration of what I have been uh, telling you uh, up to now, a nice, a nice illustration of the importance in Cesalpino's methodology or of both a close, a very close observation of plants and a clever use of uh, inherited concepts and doctrine, uh, of concept and doctrine inher inherited from the Aristotelian tradition. Um, and this balance is also uh, exemplified uh, by uh, Cesalpino's uh, way of classifying plants, of, uh, by Cesalpino's classification, about which uh, Quentin is going to say some words now. Thank you. So what about Cesalpino's classification? As I said, it's probably the first modern botany treaty because mainly because of these epistemological talks about classification that were made uh, very explicit. So before it was very um, uh, common to apply a classification method, but not necessarily to think about the method itself. Um, and this method, as, I al as, as I've already said in Cesalpino, uh, it's thought to be really independent from medical consideration, which is very also important because um, previously a, class a good botanical classification was intended to uh, reflect pharma pharmacological uh, properties or more generally speaking, uses of plants. Or it was totally artificial because it was um, uh, serving only a very practical aspect in classifying plants uh, by alphabetical order, for example. What Cesalpino uh, uh, did was to base the, his own natural uh, system of classification on multiple morphology. Before Cesalpino, it, it was more common to use only one characteristic of, of one organ to build a, a very artificial kind of classification. So only the uh, form of the leaf or uh, the form of the root 
was selected to build a classification or only um, few characteristics or a set of uh, um, some properties were used, but not all the uh, characteristics of plants as he did. And this is the reason he reached a kind of natural classification uh, that means a kind of coherent and stable uh, system of classification. Because there were, there were a lot of different characteristics that lead to uh, build uh, more stable affinities between uh, families of plants. But at the same time, as we've already said, it was really influenced by Theophrastus classification and especially the four great genera division at the basis of the plant kingdom. So in a sense, it biased also the uh, on the ever of uh, building this new kind of classification. Um, another mitigation of this modern way of thinking about classification is the uh, uh, importance of observation uh, on one hand, but on the other hand, the very Aristotelian justification and uh, finalist uh, way of thinking uh, he uh, used in the Plantis. And as Corentin said, for example, uh, the justification uh, of giving pr priority to flowers and seeds uh, as a more important characteristic for the classification than uh, roots or stems or leaves, leaves is uh, justified by the Aristotelian uh, um, idea that the reproductive faculties, the reproductive faculties, sorry, um, is more important. So fruits, flowers, and seeds should should be more important to classify plants. Uh, another. <clears throat> restriction of this uh, natural method of classification is that even if you used a lot of different uh, characteristics and that some of them are clearly considered as more important because of the stability and curry runs they allowed, for example, to seeds and flowers, there, the, there are no clear hierarchy or weighting of these characteristics. And this is something very important for modern uh, uh, botanical classification, but that was uh, uh, possible only two centuries later with the natural system of classification of uh, Antoine Laurent de Jussieu. So this is something very complicated to achieve. So at the same time, it's probably normal that um, Cesalpino as a pioneer of classification could not uh, reach this result immediately. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another very interesting aspect of uh, the Plantis uh, is that there are no illustration within the, this book. And this is uh, really uncommon at the time because in the 16th century uh, and earlier and even later, most uh, herbary are, um, are illustrated. So there are a lot of pictures of plants, uh, engravings and so on. So we can wonder why there are no illustration in the plantis. And this is not for practical or economical reasons, linked to the very character, very expensive of these engravings. It is uh, again a methodological stance that uh, he developed, for example, in one of the dedication uh, letter he wrote. So I quote him: uh, "He who assigns them a classification, so of plants, according to nature, finds himself at the greatest ease." security and advantage of all for memorizing as well as, uh, as observing their properties. The inquiry pursued according to this way of ordering plans as the effect that a shorter description is sufficient 
so we are not forced to repeat for individual plans what is common to the whole genera. And thus, is gained from this short description such a solid knowledge that a picture could not produce a more certain one. Indeed, a picture does not show all the differences as words can. So the idea clearly expressed here is that the descriptive uh, methodology, the vocabulary and uh, attention to morphology deployed in the plant is, are supposed to be sufficient or should be sufficient in order to better understand and classify plants. So the idea of using illustration uh, is um, superfluous or even worse can be misleading because at the same time, engraver, painters, uh, or maybe even some botanists took a lot of liberties in the way they decided to represent some plants. So the picture is uh, here is an example of a uh, 16th century book uh, by Claude Duret, Ad Histoire admirable des plantes, or something like that. I don't remember the, the text, but. This painting is showing uh, this, picture, this picture, this engraving is showing a duck tree or a fish tree supposed to, to create ducks or fishes when the fruits of the trees fall on water, which is obviously an um, uh, incredible story, uh, but um, probably relate, better relate through some illustration uh, like this, but uh, generally speaking, even if we look at more um, faithful observation of uh, herbiary uh, of the time, uh, they sometimes show uh, several organs of the plant at the same time, for example, fruits and flowers at the same time, and things that are not really possible empirically. So this is the the reason Cesar Pino uh, said, for example, in the same uh, letter, my work will contain a very clear inquiry on plants unadulterated by invention, as is often observed with printed pictures. So because images can be misleading and are not as exhaustive as description, good description should be, we shouldn't use them uh, in a uh, uh, botanical treaty as uh, uh, the Alpino um, considered it, uh, it should be. Uh, when you have a good description, you, you can um, uh, deduce the species, uh, the, a single species from the description of the genus, just adding uh, a single uh, a very modern way of thinking about classification um, leading to the binomial classification, for example, in linear uh, later. Next slide, please. So another very interesting aspect of the botanical work of uh, Cetalpino is the dried herbarium uh, he, he uh, built between uh, 1550 and 1563. Uh, it, it encompasses uh, 760 uh, 60 species. This is not the oldest or the biggest uh, herbarium uh, uh, we have, but this is probably the most scientific uh, 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 herbarium because plants are, um, are organized within this herbarium uh, more or less according to the classification method defend it in the plantis to understand better its uh, classification methodology and to answer some criticism that some botanist or historian of botanist of or but of botany did to uh, the book saying for example that it was only uh, an aristotelian uh, speculative way of thinking about botany uh, build around a priori views uh, of uh, botany, deductive thesis, and so on, because the herbarium showed that through the um, uh, field 
activity he had and the observation of empirical characteristics. Uh, so after working on the Deplantis text, the secondary literature, and so on, I think that um, the Aristotelian theoretical framework is more used as a justification of his uh, empirical uh, work than uh, um, uh, original uh, thesis from which he deduced all his uh, methodological uh, uh, position. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, finally, there are also some uh, interesting physiological consideration, but this is not physiology in a very modern sense of the term. For those who know uh, well history of medicine, you probably know that Chesalpino is sometimes um, associated to the discovery of blood circulation or is discussed in the controversy about the paternity of the uh, blood circulation in the human body, which is uh, uh, currently attributed to uh, 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 RV finally. Because there are some interesting aspects of uh, uh, blood circulation in uh, some works of uh, Cesalpino, so it it, uh, it show it show uh, it shows us that Cesalpino was also interested in physiological aspects of the human body, but also of uh, the plant body, because he wanted to uh, elaborate a kind of theory of plant nutrition and growth. Uh, in a maybe more empirical, even proto mechanical or uh, fashion. So I said that the, there are no uh, proper experiment, experimental methods in Cesalpino in a modern fashion, as uh, you can see it, for example, in Galileo, who is credited as uh, one of the first uh, scientists, modern scientists who developed precisely this uh, modern way of experimenting. But at the same time, Galileo was a philosophy student of Cesalpino. So according to some commentators, he was probably influenced by this empirical or new sense of observation uh, Cesalpino himself developed at Pisa with other thinkers of uh, the university of this time. Uh, so one of the examples of this protophysiology or speculative physiology you can find in the botanical work of Deplantis is what I um, call the anatomical theory of interlocking tissues layers uh, in plants. So this is the idea illustrated on this uh, little diagram that each part of uh, the stem, for example, the pit in the center, then the wood, then the bark, uh, has some properties. And these properties are uh, the same that you find in any other uh, organ of the plants, because these parts of uh, uh, the other organs are supposed to originate from these different layers. So for example, here you can see that the, um, that the pericarp the, peri the pericarp of the fruit, so the, the fleshy part of the fruit, uh, has the same characteristic than the bark because it's supposed to be uh, created by the bark, by the bark. Uh, whereas, for example, the seed within the food, uh, within the fruit, is the uh, the part uh, generated by the pit uh, of the stem. So this theory is uh, uh, clearly false from an empirical uh, and current conception, but at the same time, it influenced a lot uh, other modern botanists, uh, even Linnaeus, for example. So this is quite interesting to see that even if uh, it looks really old fashioned, it influenced uh, some uh, uh, very important modern botanists. Next slide, please. So this is the time uh, to conclude. 
Uh, just in order to recapitulate, we can say that the Deplantis Libri is a landmark for botany because of Chesalpino's sense of observation, uh, the innovation uh, in morphology and natural classification by affinities. Uh, so classificatory characteristics should exclude medicinal properties, but also uh, must be uh, understood together and not isolated. There are, in a way, some criticism of the authorities, as you can uh, see in former Renaissance thinker uh, in Italy. Empirical dimension is important. We can maybe even uh, speak uh, about a kind of portal mechanism, for example. Uh, at the same time, the, there is also this strong Aristotelian uh, influences that justify some criticism but that are more subtle uh, to interpret, as I said. Uh, the speculative theories uh, and the use of analogies are still very important in uh, the Plantis. But in any, uh, in any, any way, this is um, a very uh, um, important testimony of the way uh, this Renaissance uh, botany is a turning point toward, towards uh, medi medieval science and modern science. Uh, thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.